God's Word. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6. God laid this strongly upon my heart this morning. Isaiah chapter 6. I'm just going to read the first few verses and then we're going to go through uh, it all together. Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 1. And the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Amen. Amen. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a nation, a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had <laughs> taken from the tongs, from, with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. You may be seated. I'm not quite sure the direction this is going to go yet this morning. We're going to start with verse 1, and then we're going to make our way through and see where the Holy Spirit takes us. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 6 starts out and says, In the year the king Uzziah died. I want to start here and say this. Uzziah ruled for, I think it was, 52 years. He, ultimately, he died from leprosy. But from what I understand, he was, a, he was a decent king. But he died, and it is at this time of his death that I, Isaiah is in the temple, and he's worshiping God. And he's there seeking God. And the first thing I guess I'd like to point out this morning before we dive into the depth of this message is this. Is that no matter... Who the world's leaders are, uh, no matter who is in control of nations, no matter who has been voted in or voted out, no matter who uh, is in charge on the earth, there is one who always sits on the throne. Amen. Leaders come, leaders go. King Uzziah died, but God still sat upon the throne. It says the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and he was high and lifted up. He was exalted. So he was still there on his throne in spite of the death of the king of Israel. He was there in spite of what they were mourning over. He was still there sitting upon the throne. So no matter who is ruling, no matter who is in charge, no matter who goes and who comes, no matter who's exalted, who's torn down, Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, God, the triune God, sits upon the throne. So you and I need not fear, because he sits upon the throne. The psalmist, I believe, wrote that the heavens is his throne and the earth is his footstool. He's always there. He doesn't leave. He doesn't take a break. He's always upon the throne. He's always watching and looking and paying attention to his creation. That's why the Bible says that he knows the very hairs of your head. He knows every sparrow when it falls from the sky. He knows all of that because he is, uh, uh, he is intently involved. He's, we have his full attention in this world. No matter who's on the throne, no matter who's in charge here, God is still setting upon the throne. You saw him high, and he was lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And I'm going to try in some earthly way to describe to you. When Isaiah sees this, he's seeing a vision, similar to other visions that prophets and people had seen. So even though he was in the physical temple, what he's seeing here was not in the physical temple. He's seeing it in the spiritual temple. He's seeing in the spiritual. And the Bible says that God is high and exalted. I mean, his throne is above everything else. And that the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, when I think about a train, in my mind, I think of a cape. Mm -hmm. That's just how I've always thought. But when he talks about the train of his robe, 
It's talking about just the hem. The end of the garment. The hem. Meaning that he is so large, filling this place, that just the hem of his garment filled the temple where Isaiah was. What Isaiah saw, just the hem of his garment. Now, if you remember, the lady who had the issue of blood, what did she do? She touched the hem of the garment of Jesus. She was able to come up and touch the bottom of his robe. Mm -hmm. God's robe is so big. Mm -hmm. It is demonstrated here that he is so large. It's basically showing you the might and the magnificence of God. That just the hem, the bottom of his robe, filled the temple. I imagine... Isaiah not even being able to see the face of God, but merely seeing the feet and the legs as he sat upon the throne. That's just how big he is. That's how I see it in my mind's eye. This, he can't even fully take in. He knows it's the Lord. He knows it's the throne. He knows it, but the, the, the train itself fills the temple. I mean, I cannot comprehend. It would, it would just fill in this little room would be absolutely amazing. So it says that his train filled the temple. It was exalted above everything. And then it said that there stood seraphim, and each one had six wings. Now these are similar to the four beasts that are described, the four of the beings described in, I believe it's uh, Revelation chapter 4, that John saw in the book of Revelation. And these four beings, these created angelic beings, they are around God's throne day and night. And this is all they do day and night is they cry out what's here. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, the, uh, Isaiah is careful to point out one thing about these seraphim. And, and I find this interesting. He doesn't describe their faces. In the, in, the, in the book of Revelation, it goes a little further about their bodies and their faces. But here, he only talks about their wings and what their wings are doing. So they've got three pairs of wings. They've got six wings. Two wings are covering their eyes, two wings are covering their feet, and then with two wings they're flying around the throne. And so this is what that means, and this is what it relates to worship that I hope that I can articulate today. The two wings that they are covering their eyes with is saying that they could not look upon the glory of God. They could not look God full in the face. Now these are created angelic beings. They have never sinned like mankind has. They've never fallen like mankind has. They were created with the sole purpose of sitting around God's throne, flying around, uh, standing guard by the throne of God, worshiping and declaring His holiness all the time. Yet even they cover their eyes because they could not look upon God and His glory. Not only did they cover their eyes, they covered his, their feet. And they covered their feet because it was a show that they were unworthy to be in the presence of God. They did not serve to be in his presence. They did not earn the right to be in his presence. They were created building feet. They were less than God. They were unworthy. And so with two they covered their face. And with two they covered their feet. And it was a demonstration of our worship of how God should be worshipped. We have cheapened worship. Wow. Worship. We come before God, we have professional worshipers. We have worshipers who take God for granted. I've done that in my life more than one occasion. Who, instead of lifting up holy hands, have lifted up unholy hands. Wow. Instead of speaking holy words, we speak unholy words. Or we speak holy words out of a sick mouth, wow. out of a twisted heart from a soul, a heart that's corrupted with sin because we're not pure and because we do not respect and fear God the way that God deserves to be respected and feared. Now, I want you to look at these beings. These beings never fell. They don't have a sin nature. They never sinned. They were created by God at the beginning of time. Whenever he created them, if it's been with all eternity, we do not know. But whenever they were created with God, they were created perfect and without sin, and they never have sinned. Yet even they, in the presence of Almighty God, cannot look upon him. And they still feel so unworthy that they cover their feet. And with two wings, they fly around the altar, the throne, and serve God. That lets us know this. The priority in our relationship with God is worship. Amen. Everything else is secondary. Service is secondary. 
Everything else in our relationship with God is secondary to worshiping Him. To honoring Him. And when you and I honor and worship Him, we are to do so in humility. We are to come before Him in humility. Let me tell you uh, 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 here. It says that when the seraphim cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of His glory. I mean, they are crying out so loud that it says the posts of the doors of the temple, the gigantic, the, the gigantic structure was shaken by the voice of the seraphim. And look at this. And the house was filled with smoke. Now let me tell you another time that this smoke appeared. It was in the book of Exodus chapter 19, if you want to mark it and read it at some time. The book of Exodus chapter 19. God has gathered the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai, and he plans on showing them his glory. They're at Mount Sinai, and God pulls up Moses and said, Moses, I'm about to descend upon this mountain. And when I do, there's some things going to happen, but before I do, I need to warn my people. You need to tell them, do not cross into the smoke. Do not cross this barrier. He told Moses, set up a barrier. Don't let anybody into that barrier. They're not to go beyond that barrier. And if they do, animal or person, I'm going to kill it. Huh. That's, that's what he said in Exodus chapter 19. And so they set up the barriers all around Mount Sinai. And when God descended upon the mountain, just a fraction of his glory. Because if he said his whole glory, it would have consumed everything. Just a small fraction of his glory. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 19, smoke covered this mountain. A mountain, folks. Not a temple, not a room. A mountain. It engulfed the entirety of the mountain. And here's the other thing that happened. The mountain shook like an earthquake. The mountain rumbled and shook like an earthquake. So when just a fraction of God's glory came upon this mountain, just a small portion of his glory set upon this mountain, that God was going to reveal himself to the nation of Israel. It was covered in smoke, and the whole mountain shook, and the presence of God in it is glory. And the people were afraid. They had a right to be afraid. Now, they were fearful and that they were afraid God was going to strike them dead. They should have been fearful in a way of respect and reverence at the power and the awesome might of God. God who had chosen them and who had delivered them. Not afraid that he was going to smite them, but afraid of his glory, his presence, his holiness. Does that make sense? So just a portion of God's glory descended upon the mountain. And it was covered in smoke, and it shook. So here in Isaiah, Isaiah is in this spiritual vision in this temple, and it's the same imagery. The temple shook, right? The pillar shook, the door frame shook, and the place was filled with smoke. Again, a small fraction of God's glory. You and I talk about wanting the glory of God to fall, but we are not prepared for the glory of God to fall. Moses was chosen by God. And God chose him and the priests, probably the leaders of each tribe. At this time, there was no priestly order. So it would have been the priests of the tribe, Aaron, and then the leaders of each tribe. To, they were allowed to come. Nobody else was. They were called and chosen. Moses was God's chosen. Only ones allowed in the presence and the glory of God. And it was just that much. Not even enough for you and I to measure. But it shook the mountain. Now, the people were afraid there. And here in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah is talking about this, his reaction was not to dance. His reaction wasn't to lift his hands. His reaction wasn't even to cry out holy like the seraphim. His reaction wasn't to declare God's glory. His reaction was not to worship. What was his reaction? Woe is me, for I am unclean. I have unclean lips, and I dwell among a people who have unclean lips. He was broken by the glory of God. He did not want worship. He did not dance. He did not jump up and down. He did not sing. 
He simply fell upon his face and said, woe is me. A fraction tiny, and this was just a vision of God's glory. We see this happen in other places. In John, when John the Revelator is taken into heaven, when he sees God, it says he was struck like a dead man. Struck like a dead man, he fell upon his face. When Job had a conversation with God in the book of Job towards the end, and God talks to Job and says, answer me this. And he goes through and God says, you know, who put the sun in its place? Who put the moon in its place? Who tells the oceans they can only come this far? Who knows where the Leviathan is? When God revealed to Job just a small fraction of his glory, this is what Job said. Job said, I abhor myself. I don't deserve to be in God's presence. That's his words. I abhor myself. God, forgive me. We have too many people, including myself, who enter into God's house to give him worship or are at home, and we are entering into worship with the wrong attitude. Instead of humility, we're entering into worship with pride like we deserve to be there. Amen. I read this week that all the Hebrews said what? We have a right to come before God and to come boldly before the throne of grace, not by myself, through Jesus. If I go to God with my myself, well, that he don't pay no attention, right? Uh, you know, it doesn't do any good to boldly approach the throne of grace by myself. The boldly approach to the throne of grace has to be done through Jesus, the sacrifice that he made, the mediator who bridged the gap between God the Father and us. For God is holy. He's so holy that he cannot have sin even in his presence. In heaven there is no sin. When, when, when the thought of sin crossed the heart of Satan, he was cast out and all the, the angels with him. No sin will be allowed in heaven. That's how holy he is. No rebelliousness, none of that. Job said, I abhor myself. In order for you and I to worship God in the way that he deserves, we must first understand who we are. Mm -hmm. And it does not matter my intelligence, mm -hmm. my ability to reason in God's word. It does not matter my musical ability, whether it's on an instrument, whether it's to sing. It doesn't matter how talented I am in anything. Before God, I am nothing. Woe is me. Amen. So if you and I are coming into the presence of God to worship and honor him with an attitude of pride and arrogance, it is disgusting to God. Mm. Now look, I've had times where I've worshipped God from a heart of pride. I am willing to guess every person in this room who has worshipped God has worshipped God from a heart of pride or from a heart that was not pure. Mm -hmm. And before you and I can worship and honor God the way that he deserves, the first thing I have to do is make sure my heart is pure. Yeah. I'm not going to be perfect. No one's asking anyone to be perfect. What we're saying is we need to make sure every unconfessed sin has been confessed. Mm -hmm. That we do not enter into his presence with unconfessed sin. We do not try to worship him knowing full well that what we've done and not confessed it, that we've been rebellious, that we've denied him all week long, that we've been disrespectful to him, and then expect to enter into his presence and worship him. And when I talk about worship, let me say this. I'm not talking about everyone worships the same way. So let's just go ahead and get that out in the open right now too. We have people who worship by lifting their hands, people who remain quiet. There are people who shout, and there are people who whisper and, or say it in their heads. So let me understand, I'm not talking about the way we worship. I'm talking about the heart of worship. Amen. Right? Exactly. From the heart, as Sister Nancy and the worship team sang today. Because God sees through the pomp and circumstance. He sees through the speaking in tongues. He sees through the yelling from the stage. He sees through everything we say with our lips. He sees right through the heart, and he knows if it's genuine or not. Now, the psalmist talked about a sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise is still coming from a pure heart. It's when you even don't feel like it, but you're still doing it anyways because you're not doing it with wrong motivation. You're not doing it with pride. You're doing it because you're praising God that you know is worthy even though you don't feel like it. 
even though you're hurting, even though you're pain and pain. That's a sacrifice of praise. So let me understand, let you say that. If you're worshiping God and you still feel hurt, you feel broken, you even feel have questions for God, as long as you're not being disrespectful and angry, you're worshiping God with a sacrifice of praise. He honors that. Right? But what I'm talking about is a prideful heart, an arrogant heart. When you and I worship God, we must be humble, not performers. Right. God has enough performers. He doesn't need performers. Mm -hmm. Our society has enough performers. Our churches have enough performers. We have enough people on stage making it all about them. We don't need any more. Amen. Right? We have enough people making it all about them. We don't need more of that. It needs to be about God. And if any person, and this includes our church on the worship team, if anyone, musician, thinks it's about them and not about God, we have a problem. If we want to be seen for our outfit, or we want to be heard for our massive, awesome voice, then that's not honoring to God. Amen. Because everything I do should be to honor Him. Amen. I can't sing. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I screech. Uh, I, I can't. This morning, if you heard my voice cracking like crazy when I was trying to go, <laughs> right? But I will tell you that I believe that even in my screeching and my cackling, God honors that Amen. because of the heart it comes from. Right. To him, it's still a sweet smelling aroma. Right. Mm -hmm. To him, he's saying, my child is worshiping me from a heart that is pure. Right? And, and God's not asking us to purify our own heart because we can't. All he wants us to do is to live and confess our sin before him, live in a way that's honoring to him, and not let things hang out there. And he's also saying we should never elevate ourselves to be equal to him. Cannot worship God. You, okay. You cannot worship something that you are standing next to. Let, let's get that out right now. So if I think that I can stand next to God, I'm not worshiping God. Okay. If I think my talent or my super spirituality or my Bible understanding, if I think I can stand next to God, that gives me a right to sit on his left or his right. Guess what? I'm not worshiping him. Because the proper posture for worship of anything is to bow before it. Now, of course, I'm not talking about always a physical bowing before God, a humbling of ourselves. See, that's what it means when you bow. That's what it means when you they fell on their face. They were humbling and recognizing that they did not deserve to be there. They were somewhere they should not be. They didn't deserve to be in God's presence. They did not deserve to be there. To hear from God, for God to speak to them, for God to even be there. And so they fell and said, God, have mercy. That is a humility. You, and we enter into God's presence with humility. Amen. God, I don't deserve to be here. If it was not for you, I would not have taken my next breath this morning. Now, please, I hope you understand I'm not talking about living in condemnation of our past. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about walking now and in the future, but walking according to God's word and in fellowship with him. So I'm not trying to bring down condemnation to say that we're worthless things. That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to put it in a perspective that compared to God, he deserves our worship and we are nothing compared to him. The Bible says uh, we are but a vapor and then we're gone. He writes, uh, who am I that God is even mindful of me? Yet he is anyways. And that's the good news, right? That as great as God is and as big as he is and as powerful as his glory is and how awesome he is, he still knows your name and my name. He still knows you. He still loves you. Man. He still cares about you. I got to tell you, Man. last night I was laying, I was praying here last night and I, I was laying on my side and I just said, God, I need a hug. I said, God, I don't want to leave this place. I need a hug. I need you to tell me you love me. Sometimes you just want a hug. Guess what? I didn't get a hug last night. Yeah. But then this morning, Sister Nancy said, wrap your arms around you and hold yourself because sometimes you just need God to hold you. Let me tell you something. Back there, I knew that was for me. Because last night, I asked for him to hold me, Amen. to hug me. And while I left this place feeling better than I came in, I could not tell, I can't tell you honestly that he helped me or told me he loved me. But when she said that, I knew that that was for me. God was saying, I'm giving you a hug. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, I love you, Curtis. Amen. Amen. Now let me tell you something. That's amazing that God would do that for me because I don't deserve it. And instead of me coming with pride 
and arrogance, believing that I deserve something. I should come in humility and say, thank you, God, for having mercy upon me. Amen. We should never take pride in our talents or our abilities and what God's blessed us with and be prideful and arrogant because I deserve nothing. It is His grace and His mercy. And when I worship Him, it should come from that heart, God, I don't deserve you. Amen. When I look at my wife, I tell her, and I believe this, I don't deserve her. My boys tease me all the time that I married up. <laughs> right? I hit the lottery, and I did. I love my wife. Not only is she beautiful, uh, but she, I could not, I pray for my boys to have wives like their mother. Amen. You just have no idea. Amen. And um, I tell her, I don't deserve you. Right? I, I don't deserve you. She waits on me. She does my laundry. She works a full-time job, and she does everything I need for our household, my boys, everything. I don't deserve her. So I honor <coughs> her because I don't deserve Amen. her. Amen. That's good. I love her because I don't deserve her. And on a much larger scale, exponentially, we should love God because we do not Amen. deserve Amen. him. Amen. If we want to have just that small taste of God's glory in our life, his presence, in more than a superficial way, it starts with humility and saying, God, I do not deserve you, Amen. yet you had mercy upon me anyway. Amen. That's worship. Amen. That's honoring God. And you don't just do that here or in a building. You do that at home, too. Amen. Worship God at home like you want to worship him here. I'm not putting on a show. We're not putting on a show. Uh, we don't. We need to worship God like it's just him and I and nobody else is paying attention or watching. I've been convicted by that. I will tell you. I'm not perfect. As a pastor, I feel like I need to show you guys that I'm worshiping too. Right? And there are times when I just want to be quiet, but I still do more because I want you to know that I'm worshiping God. There's a stigma with that, right? But I'm saying, God, change me. I want to worship you here like I worship you at home. I want to worship you home like I worship you here. Not put on a show, but to honor him and worship him. Worship team, I want you to worship God. I don't care if you sing. I want you to worship God. Because it's not about your voice. It's about honoring God. Put the mic down. I don't care. Worship him. Nancy, quit playing. I don't care. Worship him. You guys, worship him. Stand up, sit down, sing, don't sing, I don't care. Worship him. That's right. That's good. Worship him from a heart of humility and graciousness. And when you and I worship, God shows up. Amen. Jesus, when they asked, the disciples asked him how to pray, he said, pray like this. And how did he start that prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you and I come before God, if you want to feel his presence, to know his presence, if you want him to speak to you, if you want him to be there with you, it starts out with hallowing his name. Yes. God, you are worthy. Mm -hmm. You deserve praise. When you hallow yes. something, you are elevating it above yourself and you are recognizing you don't deserve to be in its presence. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. You are saying, God, you're worthy, beyond worthy, beyond my comprehension or my understanding. Hallowed be thy name. And God, one of the things that God's been working on me with, with praying, because I, 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 I feel even after all these years, I've been begging him to teach me how to pray. And so I'm starting now with the Lord's Prayer. And when I start, I pray the Lord's Prayer, but I customize it for what I'm praying for that day. So I always start with, hallowed be thy name. And one of the things Elmer Towns talks about is you worship the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So you worship God the Father, and you worship God the Son, and you worship God the Holy Spirit, and take their names from Scripture and honor them each individually. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm saying, but that's something I'm working on right now with myself because that's amazing. So yeah. you start with, hallowed be thy name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hallowed be your name. You're awesome. You're mighty. You're gracious. Yeah. You're loving. You're caring. You're all powerful. You're ever present. You're all knowing. You're everywhere. You know what I'm saying? God, you're greater than me. Yeah. 
And I don't deserve you. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. I don't deserve you. And when God sees that heart of humility, he will answer it with his presence. Amen. He will. He inhabits the praises of his people. Worship, worship, worship is not singing songs. It's not simply singing songs. I want you to understand that. That's not worship. Worship is not a program. Worship simply isn't playing a song. Worship comes from the heart. So if you're singing from a heart of humility, that's worship. If you're playing from a heart of humility, that's worship. If you're, you, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. If I am speaking God's word from a heart of humility, that's worship. Anything that is not from a heart of humility is not worship. Right? And we need to check ourselves in God's presence. God, how am I approaching you today? And by praying that Lord's Prayer, it helps me to center myself and say, Father, basically what I'm saying to me is I humble myself before you and I confess my dependence upon you as who you are. Everything. Right? Mm -hmm. It centers my mind because when you and I approach God, we boldly approach him through Christ. Meaning Christ, he mediates between us. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve to be there. I don't deserve to worship him. I don't deserve to honor him. I deserve none of that. None of it. I hope I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but this has been very, it's heavy on my heart. Worship has been something that's been heavy on my heart now for a few weeks. We've had good services. We've had good services recently. But let me tell you something. Worship comes before prophecy. Mm -hmm. Worship comes before words. Mm -hmm. Worship comes before change. Mm -hmm. Worship starts it all. Right? And if we're not worshiping, we cannot expect for God to speak to us. Amen. Worship is critical. Our relationship is built on worship. One of the things that God's been dealing with me is this. I would keep saying, I want to know you more, God. Mm -hmm. I want to know you, mm -hmm. right? Know who you are. And every single time it comes back to the same thing. Worship me. Every book that I read, worship me. That's where it starts. Worship me. You want to know me more? Worship me. And when I worship him, he reveals himself to me. Amen. Because he honors the humble and the dependent. If I'm not humble and dependent, I, I think I don't need him. Why would he show up? Say so. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If I'm so talented, I don't need him. Right? If I have such a great music ability playing or singing, why do I need him? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens in our society. We've got churches today with praise teams that are performers like a play. They're not honoring God with their worship. And we're eating it up because we are a consumer society. We're not worshiping ourselves. We're being entertained. Smoke and flashing lights. <laughs> right? So please, but I want you to understand I'm not criticizing if, the, if you've got, a, if there's a praise and worship team and they're honoring God and the church is worshiping, that's one thing. But let's be honest, a lot of the worship is simply about performance. And that's not what it's about. It's about from a heart of humility and dependence upon God. We worship God that way and things will change. Absolutely. Because when God shows up, things change. Gotcha. When I humble myself before him, things change. Amen. When I, when I uh, confess my dependence upon him, things change. Amen. Right? All right, so when Isaiah cries out, he says, woe is me, I am done. I am undone. I don't deserve to be here. One of the seraphim flew to him and took a coal which had been taken from the altar. So he takes tongs and he takes representatively a coal from the altar that's in heaven. So the, the, this remember this is a vision. He's seeing the temple in heaven. He's seeing God's throne in heaven. He's seeing the altar just like it would be in the temple. And an angel comes down and he takes a hot coal from where they would sacrifice at the altar or burn incense or whatever. And he goes to Isaiah and he presses the hot coal against his lips. Now, I don't know if you've ever been burned. But it don't feel good. When Isaiah confesses, repentance hurts. 
chastisement hurts. It hurts me. It is painful, right? The process to change my thinking, my reasoning, it can hurt. Repentance is sometimes painful. The cleansing process is sometimes painful. But the result is purification. And that's what the seraphim says. He says, I have touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. So Isaiah recognizes that he, he, he humbles himself. He recognizes that he's sinful. He recognizes the nation is sinful. And so God from the altar purifies him with the altar from a coal, a fire from the altar. And then it is no coincidence that once all of these things happen in order, God is still on the throne even though Isaiah is dead. God reveals himself, right? The, 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 the glory of God and that's, you know, is there in the train. He sees all these things. He sees the worship. Right? His feeling of just feeling unworthy, humility, sinful in the presence of God, his repentance and his purification, all of that, the culmination of it is, is God says to no one in particular, who's going to go for, before us? Who will speak for us? He says, to the room at whole, he doesn't notice, he doesn't say Isaiah. Will you go? What does he say? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? When you and I humble ourselves and we are worshiping him, that's when we can serve. And we will want to serve. Because of who he is. Notice Isaiah did not have to go and pray about it. My stepdad was funny. Every time he asked to do something, he'd tell you to pray about it, which meant he wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. He was hilarious. He, 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 that was his thing. You know, Paul, can you pick up so-and-so? Well, I'll pray about it. That meant no. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah didn't stop to pray, say, I'll pray about it. He didn't have to contemplate. He didn't have to go think. Why? Because he had experienced the very presence of God. He had seen some small uh, bit of God's holiness and who God is. He had experienced God's mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. He had humbled himself before God. So when God said, who will go for us? Who can we send? Isaiah shot his hand up in the air and said, here I am, God. Send me! Exclamation point. He shouted it. Above the rumbling, above the smoke, above everything that was happening, he shouted, here I am, God, send me. Not out of pride, not out of talent, not out of arrogance, not out of any of those things. He did it out of humility and a dependence upon God, but because of God's grace and God's mercy. So when God said, who can I send? Isaiah said, I will go. Serving him. Because of who he is. Prayer, or praise is first. That's why the seraphim had their eyes covered and their feet covered. Then their service. That's what their wings were doing as they flapped around the altar. They, 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 they were around the, I mean, the throne. All of that had to come first before Isaiah was in a place to serve. And then when he served, boy, did that man serve. God had him do some interesting things and say some very hard things to a nation that was apostate about judgment that was coming. But then he also said some great things about the Messiah that was coming. And God used him in a mighty way. Read the book of Isaiah sometime from mm -hmm. front to back and you'll be amazed at God, what God revealed to him and what God used him to do and what courage it took in some things that he had to say that God gave him to say. But he had the courage and he had the desire and he had the unction to do it because of what happened in Isaiah chapter 6 starting with verse 1. That's why he was able to give the message that followed as well as the messages in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. Go read it. It's amazing. 
So when you and I really humble ourselves before God and we understand our dependence upon Him, acknowledge it, we're worshiping Him, knowing Him more, He's revealing to us little bits of who He is, and we're growing with Him and knowing Him, and we're honoring Him, and we're taking care of the sin that's in our life and trying our best to live purely, and as soon as we mess up, we are confessing it, and we're striving not to mess up, you know what I'm saying? And we're living lives that are holy and acceptable. We're being transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? Those things are happening. We're being sanctified daily. <clears throat> then we're ready to serve. We will want to serve. We will want to to tell people the good news of Christ. Amen. We will want them to know our God. We will want them to experience salvation. We will want them to know about Christ and the Savior and know a price that he paid and his resurrection and what awaits in glory. We'll want them. Though You won't have to have a preacher beg us to tell people about God because we will be in a right relationship with Him and worshiping Him and we will want them to experience and know God the way that we're learning to know Him. Amen. We won't have to be begged, coerced, prodded. We'll do it because of our relationship with Him. Tell the message. Serve Him. Even though that's secondary to the worship, the worship will always lead to service. If you and I are worshiping God from a heart of humility and dependence, if we are worshiping him in purity and in spirit and in truth, it will always lead to service. Always. Not because of his greatness. It will be because of his greatness, who he is, his mercy upon us, and because we want others to receive. We want others to know him. Amen. When I understand who I am, and I understand who I am in light of who God is, it will forever change our lives. It will change my life, your life. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope that you enjoyed it and were blessed by it. Each month we have people from all over the world who listen to the messages made available. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you consider making a donation of any amount to help support us as we continue to reach the loss for Christ? Donations can be made online at www.reviveoc.org or by check at Revive Outreach Church, 411 Chatham Heights Road, Suite 101, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22405. Thank you for your prayers and your continued support. May God richly bless you.